1961, two New York City narcotics detectives broke what at that time was the largest narcotics case in the history of the United States. $32 million worth of uncut heroin. The case was broken by two detectives who almost stumbled into it out of their incredible instinct for what was happening in the streets. And these were detectives Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso. About 10 years later, when I set out to make the film The French Connection, I based the story closely on the characters of Egan and Grasso and the narrative that they gave me about how they happened to come on this case, subsequently to break it, and how ultimately there was a great deal of frustration in bringing all of the people involved to justice. I tried to give the film the flavor of a documentary to make the audience feel as though you were in on the surveillance and you were in on the chase and the bust. And in order to do that, we had no sets. We filmed on actual locations in the streets of New York in one of the coldest, most severely brutal winters in the history of New York. The cast, of course, was led by Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider playing Egan and Grasso and Fernando Rey, who played Charnier, the smuggler from Marseille. There were, in the course of the making of the film, about nine scenes that I didn't use. They were all character scenes. Some of them have been found. A lot of it has been lost. But in any case, here are some of the out scenes that were never used in the final cut of The French Connection. This first sequence is just a continuation of a sequence that's already in the film when Detective Doyle, played by Gene Hackman, goes into the lobby of the Westbury Hotel and charms the desk clerk into giving him information about the mysterious Frenchman, Charnier, who he's just trailed into the hotel. Originally, I felt it would be very interesting to see how Doyle could turn on the charm when he was talking to somebody who was peripherally connected to the case and how he could elicit information simply on charm only. As you saw earlier in the film, his technique was generally to beat information out of a suspect. But in this case, he's exuding his finest charm. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, they just walked in there. What's his name? Sorry, I don't know who you mean. Got up on the sixth floor. No, we've got four rooms and six apartment suites on the sixth floor. And there's a man in almost every one of them. This guy is, um, oh, he's, um, about, about this high. Salt and pepper gray hair, uh, 45 or 50, you know, he's got one of those little, uh, uh, well-dressed guy. Now, there's no one like that on the uh, sixth floor. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was visiting a guest. No, I figure he stays here. Let's see your registration. Sure. <clears throat> now, let's see. No. There's no one on the sixth floor that fits that Nobody description. Nobody on the sixth floor. You know, there just may be two or three others that do fit that description. Though. Can you give me the names? Well, there's, there's a Mr. Paul Ganopoulos. He's, he's here alone. Mm -hmm. Where's Paul from? Uh, he's from Des Moines. You're from Des Moines. Mm -hmm. What's he do? Businessman. Owns a department store, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a Mr. and Mrs. Alain Chonnier. Uh, he's, uh, he's in shipping, I think. Charnier? Charnier. Yeah, how do you spell that? C-H-A-R-N-I-E-R. -E Anybody else? Yeah, there's a Mr. Uh, Michael Lowenstein. I don't know what he does, though. Lowenstein. This, um, Charnier character, uh, You say he's in shipping? Yeah, I think so. But they're in room 408. That's the fourth floor. Where's he from? Marseille. That, that's in France. Yeah, I know. 
As I say, there were nine scenes that I shot in the French Connection. Each one of the scenes was a character、uh, development scene.、Uh, it, I shot them in the hope of giving you some further insight into the nature of the people involved. As it turned out,、uh, those scenes turned into scaffolding, and when the structure was complete. I just took down the scaffolding. I felt I didn't need it anymore. This particular scene had to do with the French gunman played by Marcel Bazoufi, whose name in the film is Pierre Nicoli, and I was trying to show that Nicoli, who could be such a cold-blooded, brutal killer, himself enjoyed being brutalized at the hands of a prostitute. He puts himself totally in her hands until she tries to elicit money from him. At that time, he reverts back to his nature and he threatens her life. The scene is really about power, about Nicolie's willingness to surrender power to this prostitute, and、uh, then when she takes it. He really、uh, can't go along with the game ultimately, and you get a sense that this is going to be another one of his victims. But again, it was to show the the two sides of his nature: brutal and submissive. You're fifty dollars short. The path of the scene's a hundred and a half. Hey, Frenchie, you better come up with a scratch. I got a man waiting downstairs. <laughs> This scene is an improvised scene by Gene Hackman and by a man named Fat Thomas, who is no longer with us.、Uh, he was a great New York character. In fact, he found me all these locations for the French Connection. Fat Thomas was a real character, a very interesting guy who really had a sense of the underbelly of New York. We shot in this bar called Mucci's. Uh, there was an actual Mucci, but Fat Thomas is playing Mucci here, and I shot this scene to kind of show that Doyle had a, a casual connection with the underworld and its characters. That Doyle would hang out in a bar that was frequented by criminals, and he would be accepted by the owner、uh, as much as would be the criminals who who were regulars in that bar. What are you doing out so late? Hiding from the cops? No, I just came by to help you carry home your money. I hear the health department is going to close you down for selling dirty beer. They'll close you down if they ever get a look at those busted police broads you're running around with. Hey, Mooch, you want some eggs? Why not? I got this little chick I'm trying to hit on. Twenty, twenty-one years old. I take her to Jilly's last night. Starts giving me that stuff about settling down and getting married. I say, baby, this is 1971. I'm just a dirty old man looking to score with some pussy. <laughs> Strike out, huh? Yeah, in the late innings. You look like a nice sleep wouldn't hurt you. Why don't you put the torch in this place? Marvin, Marvin is busy. Marvin Marvin's in Detroit this week, breaking down a shoe factory. <laughs> He's a busy kid making parking lots. Making parking lots. What's he got? He's got some new stuff. It's better than Napalm. One tool takes down the whole factory. He told me. He make a lot of money. What's he get、um, for a job though? Well, five, he starts five thousand. Five, five yeah, he starts with five thousand. He's bigger than Kenny. Made four, more parking lots than Kenny. 
There's another scene, again improvised, that shows Hackman with about 15 or 20 actual uh, ex-cons and guys who were working the rackets at that time, and they're having just casual conversations about the racketeering exploits of these people. No chance. Are you kidding? For Christ's sake, Brown, I'm not going to jack off. Hey, he's seven foot tall. He's got a 12-foot reach, right? It's geodesics. He's punching down on you with leverage. Put so when did gloves. you start out as a Jew fighter? <laughs> when were you the new Jewish show? Levi Omensky. Levi Omensky. What happened? Well, I got nailed one time. I went to a Jewish doctor. He said, what kind of Jew are you? Oh, yeah? I, said, uh, I was embarrassed. I said, what kind of Jew? I'm a Jew Jew. You know, Jew. Yeah, right. You wound up on the stage delicatessen's menu. I ate him for a week. Who, the front? I fought a guy in Cleveland one time. I knew he was a dirty fighter. So I took a crowbar and stuck it in my crotch over here. In the second round, he hit me right in the crotch. Boom! He broke his hand. The whole fight was over. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the best fighter you ever seen, Doyle? <laughs> Willie Mays. Willie, Willie Mays. Mays. <laughs> what a baseball bat. One swing, you take your fucking head off. <laughs> <laughs> the real Popeye Doyle, Eddie Egan, was on very friendly terms with a lot of the New York underworld. And that was because... Uh, he got his information that way, and they trusted him. And again, all of this was illustrative of the thin line between the policeman and the criminal. This sequence is an impression of an incident from the life of Eddie Egan, where often while he was off duty and, and coming home from a night surveillance or whatever he was doing, he would be driving through the streets, and he'd often see a girl just wandering by or on a bicycle, and he would pick her up, pretend that she'd broken some law, he would pretend that he was going to arrest her, and he would, more often than not, wind up taking her to his apartment. This is the continuation of a scene that exists in the film now, where you simply see Doyle eyeballing this young woman from the rear. And at the time we shot it, I thought it was charming. But again, as I said earlier, I just removed the scaffolding. This is another sequence where Doyle picks up uh, a streetwalker that he just casually uh, sees on the street. You own that wall? No. Why are you leaning on it? Make no mistake, all of this stuff which was going on in the police department back in the 60s would today be illegal, uh, it would be chauvinistic. Uh, Doyle would be called a racist cop. There's certain racist elements to his behavior in the French Connection. But knowing Eddie as I did, uh, I never felt that he was really a racist. I thought that what he was doing, as were other detectives at that time, was playing a game in their realization that uh, there was a very thin line between the policeman and the criminal. And... Uh, Doyle was always showing that he understood where that line was, and he understood what was on both sides of the line. In my research for The French Connection, I followed Detectives Egan and Grasso around for weeks, as did Hackman and Scheider, and I actually saw this incident where a young man came into a donut shop early in the morning. Hey, you gonna wait on me? I gotta sit here all day. Egan sensed that the guy was carrying a weapon. He knew the guy without looking at him. He had previously arrested him. He called him Hector. Hey, come here. Come here. While he was having his morning coffee and donut, he just ran a casual frisk of this guy. 
Can you stand a toss, Hector? What do you mean? You still dealing shit? Jesus, no, though. I'm clean. Man, I'm working here 12 hours a day. When are you going to make the chairman of the board? Come here. You clean your fingernails with this? I'd rather be caught with it than without it. Yeah, I guess so. And that seemed to me to give an understanding of uh, what the underworld needed to survive at that time. This guy was a small town thief, possibly a dealer. He was in and out of jail, and yet uh, Egan had the compassion to let him keep his hidden weapon, knowing that he would probably have to use it, but only in self-defense. These are but fragments of the insights that I saw uh, when I was researching the film. And whereas uh, when I saw them and when we started to edit toward the final film, um, it seemed that it was obvious that they all had to come out. The fact that we shot them made it possible for Gene Hackman and the other actors to get a deeper sense of who these characters were that they were playing and that there were many complexities to them. So I had kept these scenes sort of lying around in my garage, so to speak, for many years, and I'm now happy to share them with you for whatever they're worth, um, and uh, I'm sort of pleased by the knowledge that they will exist in some form forever on the DVD. No, I figure he stays here. Let's see your registration? Sure. Uh, well, let's see. No. There's no one on the sixth floor that fits that Nobody on the sixth floor. You know, there just may be two or three others that do fit that description. Though. Can you give me the names? Well, there's... There's a Mr. Paul Ganopoulos. He's, he's here alone. Mm-hmm. Where's Paul from? Uh, he's from Des Moines. You're from Des Moines. Huh? What's he do? Businessman. Owns a department store, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a Mr. and Mrs. Alain Chonier. Uh, he's, uh, he's in shipping, I think. Some of them have been found. A lot of it has been lost. But in any case, here are some of the out scenes that were never used in the final cut of The French Connection. This first sequence is just a continuation of a sequence that's already in the film when Detective Doyle, played by Gene Hackman, goes into the lobby of the Westbury Hotel and charms the desk clerk into giving him information about the mysterious Frenchman, Charnier, who he's just trailed into the hotel. Originally, I felt it would be very interesting to see how Doyle could turn on the charm when he was talking to somebody who was peripherally connected to the case and how he could elicit information simply on charm only. As you saw earlier in the film, his technique was generally... In 1961, Two New York City narcotics detectives broke what at that time was the largest narcotics case in the history of the United States. $32 million worth of uncut heroin. The case was broken by two detectives who almost stumbled into it out of their incredible instinct for what was happening in the streets. And these were detectives Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso. About 10 years later, when I set out to make the film The French Connection, I based the story closely on the characters of Egan and Grasso and the narrative that they gave me about how they happened to come on this case, subsequently to break it, and how ultimately there was to beat information out of a suspect. But in this case, he's exuding his finest charm. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, they just walked in there. What's his name? 
Sorry, I don't know who you mean. Got up on the sixth floor. No, oh, we've got four rooms and six apartment suites on the sixth floor. And there's a man in almost every one of them. This guy is, um, oh, he's, um, about, about this high. Salt and pepper, gray hair, uh, 45 or 50, you know, he's got one of those little, uh, uh, a well-dressed guy. Now, there's no one like that on the uh, sixth floor. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was visiting a guest. A great deal of frustration in bringing all of the people involved to justice. I tried to give the film the flavor of a documentary to make the audience feel as though you were in on the surveillance and you were in on the chase and the bust. And in order to do that, we had no sets. We filmed on actual locations in the streets of New York in one of the coldest, most severely brutal winters in the history of New York. The cast, of course, was led by Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider playing Egan and Grasso. And Fernando Ray, who played Charnier, the smuggler from Marseille. There were, in the course of the making of the film, about nine scenes that I didn't use. They were all character scenes.